early and here all day, you guys can sound better than that. All right, uh, thank you so much for coming to Parasocial Relationships and New Glasgow World Cone Edition. Uh, a couple of housekeeping things, because this is how I moderate, because uh, I've noticed this culture at SFCons. I don't care how burning your comment or question is, hold it until we say q and If you don't do that, I will embarrass you. Um, and ask anyone in this room who knows me if I will tell you to go find a question when we do get to Q&A, and I'm not joking. So, I know people want to be active and involved. Please keep your comments to yourself until we get to the designated time. Also, uh, when we do get to Q&A, have a question, not a monologue, not a backstory. Don't be parasocial in your question or inquiry. Or John or I may become very angry. Yes. <laughs> because John and I moderate the same, so this is going to be real interesting. Yeah. So, uh, that's just going to stay up there. Please follow us on socials. And are we all good with pictures and tweeting? Yeah. Yes. All right. So you have the panel's consent to tweet, Blue Sky, Instagram, whatever the fuck you're doing nowadays. And uh, we're going to start at the end and introduce ourselves before we get into the panel. Uh, hi, I'm John Scalzi. I'm no longer on uh, the former Twitter because it's a bash of cesspool. Uh, I'm on, but I am on Blue Sky Threads and Instagram and basically everywhere else. Uh, I've had a blog for 26 years, and prior to that, I was a newspaper columnist. So back in the day, my parasocial relationships consisted of phone calls and angry letters delivered in the mail. <laughs> Uh, I'm Bruce Lafferty. I've been podcasting since 2004, and I've learned a lot about parasocial relationships that way. And I've uh, been do, publishing fiction since 2013. And uh, more of the parasocial stuff still comes through the podcast, but a little bit through the fiction too. And streaming since 2020, which is a, even a different thing. Um, my name is Gabriel Elvery, or Gabe, and I'm currently completing my uh, PhD in theorizing the digital fantastic. Um, I look at the blurring of fantasy and reality in video games, and that includes parasocial relationships um, with streamers, but also with um, video game characters, like non-player characters. And if you're interested in that, you can look at, for my article um, about uh, parasocial relationships um, in Undertale and in my uh, Springer Encyclopedia entry about the topic. And I'm your moderator, Tony the Pass, also known as Psycho Tier Online. Uh, I have had a very long, unfortunate relationship with parasocial relationships. I have been streaming on Twitch for about 10 years. I've been part of the sci-fi fantasy community for a long time. Also, I do DEI consulting, or slash did do it before my day job as a game developer. So imagine that kind of stuff that I get on social media as a game dev. And, you know, just in the ways in which people have interacted with me, both in person and at cons and online, and I'm still on the health site only because that's where my best reach is, but I do have Blue Sky, Threads, Tumblr, I don't know if my live journal still exists, if it does, I haven't <laughs> it for 10 years. So, uh, we're going to have a bit of a conversation, and we're going to have a mic run around the room for questions, and I just want to talk about, you know, the things that we have experienced as parasocial relationships, because other than Gabriel, I know John and Murr, and I've seen the things people say to them online, and they've seen the things people say to me online, and how none of us have gone to jail as a mother. So, uh, you know, what are examples, you know, kind of A to explain what it is for anyone who may not know what a parasocial relationship is, but also what are things that you all have encountered or in your work or with other people? Yeah, yeah why not start with you? Okay. Um, I have. I've been, like I said, been podcasting for a while, and there's an interesting intimacy about your voice being in someone else's ears. Mm -hmm. And uh, many people have thought that we were friends. I once had a moment where um, I was invited to a podcast meetup of a bunch of people who all lived in the same general area that I did not. And when I arrived, I talked to the people I knew, but then I found out later that some people were angry with me for not including them. These are people I didn't know. I, they were there, and but apparently I, in their heads, I was supposed to be welcoming them all on the same grounds because we were all podcasters. And I, I, I've not been like outright stalked or, or accused or harassed or anything, but there's an awful lot of like little things, basically people expecting of me and, and 
my relationship to them that I didn't get the memo on. And that's kind of one of the biggest parasocial things that I've had. Yeah. Um, so, I've, like I said, I've been in the public uh, eye for basically as long as I've been writing. Um, the very first gig that I had was uh, actually a, uh, I wrote a weekly column in my college newspaper. And uh, because of that, everybody knew what I was thinking all the time, went into uh, newspapers, had, had the blog for long running. And so it has always been the case that there are people out there who have had that mediated experience of who I am through my words. And I've always been careful to say to people over and over again, that this is a version of me. It's not a false version of me. It is actually who I am. But it is just like the version of me that you are getting right now will be different from the version of me that's going to be in the bar after I lose a Hugo tonight. Um, <laughs> they're just slightly different. They're, they're just slightly different versions. But because that version is personable, because that version talks about things that are going on uh, in, in my life, there feels like there is a connection. And because of that, people will come up and talk to me as if I am a friend. They will come up and talk to me as if uh, we are picking up a conversation that we had just put down the last time uh, we were there. The flip side of that is also, there are people when they are angry with me, they are angry with me because I am not conforming to the expectation of what the image of what they have of me in their heads. Why are you not talking about this particular contentious issue, which I have thoughts on and I wish to have you have thoughts on as well? Uh, why are you having a career that I want? I'm very angry with you uh, for having that particular career. Uh, why are you raising your child or your pets in the manner that I find objectionable in any way? Uh, I wish to expound to you at length in a 30-part uh, Twitter thread uh, about why what you're doing is, is wrong. So there are pluses and minuses. I have met people who have had parasocial relationships with me who have then become friends. I also have, in fact, been stopped, and that was an adventure, I will tell you. Uh, spoiler, I'm okay. That person also uh, eventually got the help that they needed, and now they are fine as well. But you get the whole gamut of, of things, and you don't get necessarily even the benefit of actually having a friendship there. So, you're on. Oh, okay. I guess, um, yeah, it's very different for me because it's not something I've had a personal experience. Um, but, oh, okay. Thank you. Um, so, uh, in my studies, I look at, um, yeah, as I said, the blurring of fantasy and reality. And emotion and media is one of the places that um, that it really happens because you um, you have this kind of uh, mirroring effect of when you're you're going through something like a video game or when you have communication <coughs> mediated through technology. A lot of the processes that you have with social interaction um, are, are going on in, in the brain. And partly this can be absolutely a wonderful thing. Um, there's so many people that have uh, parasocial relationships um, with. Um, with celebrities, which is what we call first order a parasocial relationship. So second order would be with um, characters that actors play, and then third order would be fictional characters. And obviously the fictional characters, like that's where it's safest, and you can almost use these like video game characters as social surrogacy if you're lonely. And I know that there was a massive boom of interest uh, during the pandemic when we were all stuck inside. And um, I hope that even though you're having these like awful, awful experiences with people, there's probably so many more that are having a healthy parasocial relationship with you and they're, they're not that they're not talking to you so they're not the ones that you necessarily know but your your presence and like the work that you put out it can have such a positive influence psychologically on people who are lonely have trouble socializing um, or even just like um, ha having downtime and like, and like learning from you um, so yeah it's, 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 it's really complicated and um, I, I hope that people can start talking about this concept more so that we can put those boundaries in place because it's similar with any kind of social interaction. You can overstep, people can be obsessive about other people, people can assume things. Like if you're someone who's neurodivergent and masks a lot, you might be having almost parasocial interactions with people if you're putting on a persona or a teaching as well in the classroom you can put a persona on. So it happens so much more than we realise and I'm just glad that the concept 
is, is getting a bit more attention so that we can start um, approaching these things in more of a safe manner that's, that's good for both sides. Well, and I think you bring up a, up a really good point, which is that parasocial is not inherently negative, mm -hmm. right? It is something that, uh, you know, quite bluntly, my career is built on you all liking me <laughs> uh, in many ways. And whether that means liking me as an individual personally or liking the work that I do and feeling some sort of relationship with that. I obviously am um, on the other side of that as well. You know, there are people who are uh, musicians and authors and people that I've met online who have particular fields of expertise um, that I feel comfortable and familiar with, even if I am not, in fact, responding to them on a day-to-day -day basis. It's like, I know I can go and look at this person and from what they have posted before, they are a reliable vendor of information on this particular topic. Uh, and therefore, that level of trust and comfort is there and that it is in and of itself a parasocial relationship. So it's not inherently good or bad, it is, uh, and then it can take on aspects of good, bad, indifferent, whatever, based on the dynamic that, that we put in it. It's almost like comfort watching people sometimes. Yes. Yes. And you find that um, it, where we have social media and we have access to people, we're interacting with them to, to get that one feeling, that social feeling, that feeling of um, familiarity. And as you say, it's just like it's learning where, where the lines are. Yeah, yeah. And for me, I've, um, I've had a, a pretty much the gamut where you know I stream on Twitch and people feel like they know you because they're in your living room, whatever you're streaming from. Um, I have been stopped. It got to the point where Kotaku covered it. That was not a great month for me. Um, I almost stopped streaming. I almost stopped going to cons. I have been at events where security has shown up at the end of a panel and said, hey, we need to talk to you. This is important. Nobody ever wants that conversation, especially at a big con like PAX or PAX West. Um, and it was because of the parasocial nature of, well, I see what you do online, I see that you're a game developer, you write about feminism, you write about DEI, therefore I hate you. I don't know you, but I hate you. Or there's the, I don't know you, but I love you. Because you're in my ear, like Mo said, or you're on my video screen, and you know, this is a rough time, we're all locked down, but you're playing Animal Crossing, and that's cozy. Because I've had people that will come in and talk to me as if, we are best friends as if we're having that conversation. Or they come in and they start talking to me, and I'm like, I'm so sorry, I don't remember you. Do I know you by your name? And it's very disconcerting when people go, no, I don't know you, I just, I follow you online. I'm like, cool, in that case, please don't call me by my name, because that's a little creepy to me. Mm -hmm. Which is weird, because all of us, our names are out there. They're, like, there's, really, and this is sounds strange to say, there is a small documentary about me. So I know that I am a person that is known to others, but I don't personally know you, and you're coming in as if we are best buddies. I just saw you in the bar last night. Uh, so I kind of want to talk about the different kinds, but we may have covered that already. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about recognizing them. And you know the ways in which you recognize them, a lot of people don't seem to realize what's happening. And they, like you mentioned, Don, it's not inherently bad. Because right. people have attached, oh, parasocial is bad. That means they want something from me. They're going to be creepy and stalker. What I do on Twitch, what I'm doing here, what I do in my day-to-day -day outside of the day job is by nature parasocial. It is transactional. You like my content on Twitch, I would like you to keep giving me money to do this. So that by nature is parasocial. So, you know, at what point did you realize things were parasocial? Also, Gabe, for you, because, well, Murr and I are very much in the Baldur's Gate. I don't know if you've played it, John, or have seen the kind of Unhinged ways fandom has acted about Baldur's Gate and the actors and the characters. Um, but we've seen that too with the characters that people portray. We've seen the ways in which people come into streams and chats or talk to these actors as if they are the characters. We've seen it, you know, Sam Bayard, who's here, hopefully we'll see them later. People will come up to them and talk to them as if they are Carla in that moment, not Samantha Bayard. So, how would you all, what was your kind of, aha, this is weird, the parasocial moment? Oh geez. Um, for me, uh, again, it's the thing where, um, like, if ever since college, people would come up to me and just talk to me about the column that I had just written, um, and so, so that is 35 years of not necessarily expecting 
but at least knowing that people will randomly come up and talk to you about the thing that you were uh, like talking about or writing about or uh, participating in. And so for me, it was, it was very much of a boiling the frog moment. Um, so by the time that social media came around uh, in terms of, well, AOL, which I used to work at, um, and then you know MySpace and Friendster and, uh, and the former Twitter and so on and so forth, um, I had just sort of naturally developed the understanding of the relationship of I say something, it goes out to a number of people, it comes back in comments. I always knew that maybe like 1% of the people who ever uh, read the thing would actually comment because I had a blog and I could actually look at the stats. Um, and those, you know, and there was the first order of people who would always comment on things. And there was the second order of people who would sometimes comment on things. And there was a third order of people who never commented on anything. Um, and so I got, I, I, I sort of got used to that. And it's not only a matter of you folks out there bringing, uh, bringing the relationship to us folks, because when people uh, have that conversation with you on a familiar ground, you do feel that same sort of attachment, even if there is not. There are commenters who are frequent commenters on my site. I've never met, uh, but I know them because they have commented every day, uh, more or less, for, for 20 years. And so there is kind of that expectation and there is that feeling, especially early on, uh, of if they are saying something negative, it is about me, not necessarily about the stuff that I just written. Um, that, that you feel vulnerable when someone says something snarky about something that you said in earnest. Um, and so part of the knowledge of that that I had to learn was just as I expect everybody to realize that we're not just because I'm personal doesn't mean we're friends, it's, it's also just because they are uh, responding to me doesn't mean that I have to take that all personally on board. Now that is said couched in the fact that, uh, again, high, cis, straight, white guy, lowest difficulty setting, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but still it's something that, that I had to learn and I, and I was very fortunate that I had a very long period of time starting on an entirely different physical media uh, to get there so that when I finally did get to the digital media where it is so immediate and it is so visceral um, that I was already, I already had some walls built in. Um, before I knew the word parasocial, um, I had, I think the thing that stands out to me is, is, is this is a weird thing that's happening because of my podcast is I had uh, been friendly with a listener online and we would chat via Skype, and one day, chat pops up, and he's like, you're so funny. I'm like, what? And then, a couple minutes later, he was like, I agree with that. And I realized he was listening to my show, and responding to me in chat, as if we were literally having that conversation right then. I'm like, dude, you know that I recorded this three weeks ago, I'm not even sure what you're referring to. Um, the other thing that really kind of this was something that I had to figure out for myself because it was a very subtle thing. Um, I had a podcast called Ditch Diggers. Uh, Ursula Vernon is my current co-host. Uh, Matt Wallace, an old friend of mine, used to be um, the, the host. And Matt and I have known each other for a very long time. We're like siblings. And we, when we talk to each other, we're familiar. We, we joke, we insult, all that stuff. And I got an email from a listener and I could not tell you what about it bothered me because there was no harassment, there was no rudeness, and I just read it a couple of times and I'm like, he's talking to me like I talked to Matt. Yes. And I don't know him. I don't know this guy at all. He's just like, he hears us talk and he's accepting that that's the way people should talk to me. I don't know. And uh, it, it was a little hard to figure out because it wasn't harassment or stalking or anything. It was just conversation on a level that I was not prepared to have with a stranger. So those two things kind of were, made me feel like, okay, this is something I need to keep in mind when doing, when being out in public or in someone's ears. And then I met Tanya, and then I learned this word, so now I understand it better. Thank you, Tanya. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's definitely a kind of um, flattening that goes along with um, mediated by technology, where we have so many Kind of fictional interactions that when we interact like socially with people, it can feel the same. 
Uh, so just a brief example from my research, I don't know if um, anyone has played Undertale at all, um, but there was um, a case where um, the, the streamer Markiplier, he basically got um, harassed because he played the game wrong, and what I, yeah, played the game wrong, um, and what I, which is basically, he played it in a way that the fan base didn't agree with because he went for a violent route first before doing a kind of a pacifist route. And what I found is that it looks like the um, attachment of um, the fan base, they, were so, they have been such strong uh, parasocial relationships with the video game characters that that actually trumps their respect for somebody as a social being um, and as a human because the attachment felt just as strong and it was coming from a similar place. So yeah, when you, when you look at it um, like that, um, it, it, is, it, is, it is quite scary that these people have that kind of fantasy idea of, like, of who you are and, and um, bring that into real life. Sure. Teresa and Nielsen Hayden uh, had a statement uh, which I use frequently, so it's often attributed to me, but it's not, it's Teresa and Nielsen Hayden, who said, I am not responsible for the actions of the fantasy version of me in your head. Uh, and I think that that, when she articulated it like that, that was a real, that was a real dam breaker for me. Because, because like you said, there's something some, sometimes that you can't articulate about what is it that you are doing that I do not understand because it's making me uncomfortable. And then you realize, oh no, you have a construct of me that, that's in your head that is based on the material that you have available to you. Um, and, uh, but that material that you have available is not the complete me. It's not the me that the friends see, it's not the me that the spouse sees, it's not the me that uh, you know, my child or my pets or anybody that I know in real life sees. Nevertheless, every build, everyone builds constructs of the people that they, they know of um, with the available uh, information. And sometimes that divergence is really, really um, significant and you have to deal with it because they think that that is, that is you. Yeah. I actually encountered that, ironically, I'm posting a picture of us, John, from when you were in Chicago one time. What? <laughs> so, Murray and I have talked about this a lot and it was, you were there for the American Writers Day. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And I posted a photo with me, John, and a friend of ours, and I got it, and then someone DM'd me with, oh my god, you're Facebook friends with John Scalzi, and I'm like, yes, I, I've known John for a while, and it was just very weird, instead of the, oh, that's dope, you got to see your friends, it was, how, how, how could you be friends with John Scalzi on Facebook? I'm like, first off, Facebook is not that deep. No. <laughs> but also, and, and actually John and I had an interesting conversation because I would joke with them, it was like, oh, you have me on Facebook, but you don't follow me on, you know, now formally Twitter or whatever we're calling it. And we actually, and you actually explain like what the differences were for you. Yeah, yeah. Oh no, and that's actually a, a real thing for me. I use different social medias for different, different purposes. Uh, I have, uh, I used to have Twitter as sort of my catch-all social media when I didn't want to write a whole blog post sort of thing. Then you know it went silly, and uh, and so now I have Blue Sky, which is my very casual. I'm sort of off stage and just bantering back and forth. And I go over to Threads, where I where I yell at, at politicians and you know occasionally talk about writing. Then I have Facebook. I have a public Facebook page, which is just literally updates for uh, you know fans. Uh, then I have the private uh, Facebook, which generally is everybody I knew before 2005. <laughs> um, and on the public, on the private Facebook page, I don't talk politics because I don't want to get into an argument with my conservative aunt, right? Uh, and I and I tell people there, I'm like, uh, if you wanna, if you want my political opinions. Literally, just go over to Threads where I am ranting about that motherfucker JD Vance. Um, but uh, otherwise, this this uh, this iteration of me is cats, kids, and careers, and that's basically all you will, will get from me there. And having those silos again, and they're all slightly different personas, all me, but they are all that manifestation. Um, helps me stay sane in terms of how I'm dealing with social media, because if I put it all in one place, um, then it becomes a, a, a whirling, uh, whirling mess, and that was part of the problem, obviously, with threads, because I invested too much of, that's gonna be a little bit of everything, and it's like, no, as I've gone by, it's like, no, we have to decide on this, because um, the parasocial relationships become unmanageable without it. I see that 
that a lot with um, celebrities where they start off very online. Oh, sorry. You see that a lot with celebrities where they start off very online and they've got quite a tight knit fan base, but as they grow, generally they'll they'll limit it yeah. and they'll get somebody else to do their marketing for them yeah. because of that that parasocial strain. And then it feels a bit unfair really because you don't have that space to express yourself anymore. Um, and it just kind of shows like what you trade, like what what you kind of give up when you're doing this kind of work that you guys do. Yeah. Yeah. Can I, can I go back to the, the computer game thing real quick? Of course. Um, you know, what you're saying about Undertale, um, I was a big fan of baseball in 2020 until it died, sadly. Um, but one thing that was fabulous about the game was people, it was it was a gen, like generative horror baseball game of text, but everybody, there were different teams and each team had a, a a funny, funny name people on it, like Boyfriend Monreal and Landry Violence, which is why I have this shirt saying do it for violence, because I was a fan of that team. But um, one thing that was beautiful was that the, the uh, game itself did not put any personalities on these people. It's like this person goes to the plate and this is what they hit and these are their stats, etc. And so the, the entire community started doing it which was great, especially at the time. So they would talk about, they would pick their favorite teams and they would talk about the people and they would make up like, this person is an angel and this person is an undead lich who smokes vapes behind the 7-Eleven and she's a cranky old lady. I mean, it's like, and, and everybody loved it, but then some, you know, and, and the game company's just like, have fun guys. And then some people started to tweet as these characters. Still okay by the game company, but suddenly people were just like, wait a minute, th that's mine. That's mine. You can't put my character on Twitter to say they're going to do this because they wouldn't do that because in my head they're doing this. And people got really, really upset with how some of their favorite characters were depicted because people, the team would get together and sort of agree on general myths about people, but you didn't have to be there. You didn't have to agree to anything. You could just go on on Twitter and pretend to be the pitching machine. And um, I saw a lot of people get really hurt by how how things got out of their control when it really shouldn't have been in their control in the first place in their heads. Right. Right. As for me, um, you know, thinking about gaming and things like that, where you know. No secret, I write fan fiction. I've talked about it a lot. Sure. And, you know, thinking about what Cave does, there are people who feel so invested in, like, some of the Dragon Age characters. I've gotten nasty comments about, well, Fenris wouldn't do this. Anders wouldn't do this. I'm like, I'm sorry, they have pixels? Are, are y'all okay? <laughs> or people who will tell me, well, I know what you think of me, and I have no polite way to go. I absolutely don't know who the fuck you are. Yeah. I don't think of you that much. I literally don't know who you are. But I had someone tell me this on Twitter, and reply to something that I said, and I'm like, I, I don't follow your work, I don't know who you are, but like you said, they have that construct of yeah. who you are, what they think you are. Because there are many people who I've met, and they're like, I'm intimidated by you, I'm like, how? I'm 5'2", there's, I'm, I'm me? But they built that version of me in their head, and a lot of people seem I'm like six feet tall, I wish. Right. Well, and, and, this is, and this is something that I'm very familiar with, right? The idea that, um, you know, one, apparently I write taller than I am. Because <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm a five foot seven short king, y'all. And uh, that just, it, it doesn't get much stumpier than me. Uh, but, you know, but the thing is that uh, the idea that you are thinking of them. Like, back in my more cruel days, I would every once in a while on Twitter, which I, I left behind when I left Twitter because I realized that it was unhealthy for me to do it as much as it was unhealthy for anybody else. Um, somebody would snark about me and I would do a blind item commentary, not naming anyone. Um, and then literally like 10 people would be absolutely like, this is absolutely about me and if you keep this up, I will absolutely sue you. And you know, it's like, okay. But that goes right to the point of, um, the construct includes that you are engaged in what they are doing, or not even necessarily about what they are doing, but what their community is saying or doing um, as they are with theirs. And a perfect example of that for me involving the uh, Worldcon would have been um, the sad puppies, right? Um, 
because for them, and for those of you who don't know, 10 years ago there was a, a group of conservative authors who were upset that, uh, that they were not getting the, the flowers that they thought they should get, um, and so they decided to band together and, and publish a slate of uh, nominees that they then all went and voted on. Uh, it became a real mess. Um, they uh, did not succeed, and we have changed the way that we do things now in order to make sure that that sort of slating doesn't happen again by anybody. Mm -hmm. um, but one of the things that they needed to have is they needed to have somebody that they could rally against. Um, and they tried doing it with Nora Jemison, and Nora Jemison is not here for your shit, right? <laughs> um, she's literally not. Um, and, and when she won her MacArthur Award, it's like, oh, sorry, I have ascended and I don't have time for you. Um, but I am a, but I am a convenient uh, strawman because I am a like them, generally straight, generally white, generally male guy, uh, and I have a level of success that they aspire to, uh, but they don't have, and so that they can manufacture reasons for them to that they that I have, to, but they don't. Uh, and they built this homunculus of Scalzi, um, who is fascinating, <laughs> absolutely fascinating. And they believed that that homunculus Scalzi and they were locked in a battle of cultures and and wills and all that sort of stuff. And most of the time, I was in in my house playing video games or petting the cat or doing all that sort of stuff. I was, you know, I was online in a, a relatively small amount of time, and most most of that was not in, engaged with them until until and unless they were standing right in front of me and I had to engage with them. But for them, I was always constantly searching what they were doing, always constantly commenting on what they were doing, always constantly part of that battle. And that is uh, that aspect of of the, one of the negative aspects of this parasocial relationship. That, that sort of engagement, because they are so engaged, that you are also that engaged, because they can't imagine that what is so important to them would not be equally important to you. Um, before we talk about how to deal with them, I wanted to uh, give, talk about, and for both of you, because the Create World is one awards for this. Sure. And not just people trying to be parasocial with you, but being weird about the characters and worlds that you're creating. I had a, uh, uh, before I started publishing professionally, I did some podcast novellas, and they were about the afterlife, and they were very popular to my listeners. Um, and someone's like, okay, we're, we're going to be at Balticon next week. Do you mind if I cosplay as your players, as your characters? I'm like, no, that is awesome. That's amazing. No one's ever done that before. It's great. And they're like, can we then worship you as the god? I'm like, no. I'm not part of this game. No way. And I was really, really awkward. And the same person who asked that later on wrote slash fic about me with another podcaster. And it was, yeah. That, so that, that's, that's, that's my story. <laughs> yeah, no, uh, I know for a fact that there's Scalzi Wheaton slash fic out there. <laughs> <laughs> this is an entire fuck <laughs> and, and it, and it, so here's the thing. <laughs> I mean, yes, I mean, that, that was the whole thing. It's like, if you know the two of us and you've ever seen us interact, there's no way that there's heavy petty action, petty action going on. It's just not not a thing, and it's just sort of like. So when I was informed that this was out there, I was like, "Well, bless your heart," <laughs> uh, but honestly, I, I I don't want any part of this. I know Will too well. I know Anne too well. I don't. I really, I, I genuinely love Will. We are genuinely really good friends. I don't ever want to kiss him. <laughs> it's just not a thing. But. What's really interesting is, in terms of the characters themselves, um, I don't see too much of a par the, 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 the characters that I see that get the most parasocial relationships in my fiction are the animals, <laughs> right? Where people are really heavily invested in, in Hera from, uh, from Starter Villain, um, and also I'm gonna, I'm gonna pitch this in the, in the uh, 
Faith Here for Back Breaking, which is coming out later this year, there's going to be an exclusive story uh, about about Hera. So for all you uh, Hera fans, there'll be that. Charlie the dog in um, Fuzzy Nation. Um, basically, uh, any you know, Carl, excuse me, uh, any any animal that I met immediately gets fans. Yeah. And I do fan art of that. And I do that, you know, and so much more than the humans. And I think for me. Um, it's, it's because science fiction, for whatever reason, or maybe the science fiction that I read, does not lend itself as much to um, fan art, fan fic, and that sort of parasocial relationship thing that's going on um, as a lot of fantasy. And I don't know why that is, but it is something that I've noticed, and I, the only explanation I can have for that is that I don't do a lot of description, whereas, you know, uh, epic fantasy will go into detail about bro pop, right? And so the people who do that, who do the sort of um, cosplay, know how to do it. Like I literally had someone show up in coveralls that said KPS. I was like, look, I'm from the Country Conservation Society. I'm like, yes, I guess you are. Um, <laughs> whereas uh, uh, his his partner was dressed as death and was it just absolutely beautiful. Uh, beautiful thing. So I think the type of writing you do also has an effect on um, the parasocial relationships. Um, I'll pick up on what you were saying about your um, wonderful stories about the, um, your, your animals, is that to give slightly um, the, the other view is that um, if you can use the parasocial relationships to your advantage with um, both your, your art and your marketing. So I'm not saying that you should let your, your fans um, dictate to you what you write. Um, but I think it's absolutely wonderful to do something like you've done with a short story where you're giving them some kind of aftercare. Yeah. Because you're, you're, you're showing that, uh, no, we're not friends, but like I am, I am listening to you, like I am this art in a way. Like you're, you're, you're making something interesting, but you're also performing like an act of care. Sure. And when you take the time to listen to people who are interested in those, like, in those similar characters and give them space, uh, I'm sure they, they really appreciate it. And um, I, do, I do wonder as well if you could use the personification of those characters um, to add to your marketing, like give them their own Instagram, take the attention away from you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and get, and get, someone, get someone to role play them. It could, it could be well, well, in <laughs> fact, my, my cats uh, have their own Instagram okay. account, for, for example. <laughs> uh, so, Scamper Beast on Instagram, they're more, they're more active on Blue Sky and <laughs> Scamper Beast, uh, Blue Sky. And they and people there will be people who follow the cats who absolutely do not follow me because they're just like we don't care about you <laughs> or your characters or whatever, right? Uh, yeah, I wonder if um, you're talking about how uh, science fiction and fantasy differ um, with uh, like space operas and like co cozy writing and like cozy sci-fi. There's quite a lot of that element of uh, fantasy sure. in there. So I wonder if it's if it's that focus on the um, on the kind of relationships and like the camaraderie. Like that often goes along with like having a fantasy adventuring party, and um, it makes um, when you're when you're reading that you can almost feel like you're part of that kind of friendship group rather than you know um, it, like the high concept stuff I suppose like that won't always play into those emotional problems maybe that like cozy and fantasy. You know, I think that's incredibly cogent, and I think that's correct. For example, uh, people still want to be still uh, run around as brown folks because. The whole thing about Firefly is that whole found family community. So like the fellowship of the ring. When yeah, exactly. So when you have that dynamic, I think that is absolutely a part of it. Where they they feel that relationship to the characters, and they feel like they're a brown shirt, or they feel like they're you know uh, engaged with it on a familiar level. Yeah. So that's that, I think that's correct. And that's um, also the concept of identification. Um, so like when celebrities are relatable, like you might um, identify with them. And Oh, I can be like you, so you can see a lot of people are jealous of your success. Yeah. Uh, one way that's a very Machiavellian way to think about it is um, that kind of some some people will include kind of like vulnerability and some of the, the tricky stuff they're going through, and I understand entirely why people want to keep that private. But uh, you shouldn't have to tell someone else's jealousy. Um, but that's some of the way that some people manage their social media is by showing up. Yes, I have all this success, but oh my gosh, it's been so difficult. And like giving the backstory as well. But mm -hmm. That's like from a social engineering mm -hmm. level. I don't like the Yeah, that's not me. <laughs> um, that used to be me, and then people happened. Um, <laughs> no, I mean, haha, -ha, funny, but not really, because I've gotten to the point where 
um, sharing things. Like I'm not, I'm not gay, I'm not taking a lot of pictures here, but I'm not shared a lot because I'm sure they'll be like, oh my God, I'm so jealous, I wish I was there. It's like, well, you too can work for 15 years and become an invited guest right. of the con. Well, I mean, I will say this. I'm one of the things that I'm very transparent about. I've been, I, the, the, some of the care, as you would say, that I do with parasocial is, is transparency about, like, like, I just got a contract for 10 bucks, right? Uh, which is ridiculous, and I love it, but I also broke down how did I get to the point where they were like, sure, we'll give you 10 books, what are they about? We don't know yet, sure, go ahead. Um, and broke that down, and then I talk about the processes of publishing, and I talk about the fact that, uh, sure, I'm a good writer, but I was also incredibly lucky, so let's actually talk about luck being a, a part of your career. And in that sort of spec, um, the whole aspect of, not necessarily vulnerability per se, um, because bluntly at this point in my career, um, that that would just ring so false. But uh, authenticity, which I think is the, which is which I, which I think is the key, is like at this level doing the things that I do. Which is like I said, you know, there's another level above me. George is here somewhere. Ask him about that. <laughs> um, but at the level that I'm at, this is how it plays out, and this is uh, this is how it works. And I do think it is. I think it is actually actually extremely beneficial so that they understand where you are coming from and that it's not, as you say, it's not like unearned. It is, this is the residue of 20 years of work at the plant. Humanizes you. Yes, yeah. exactly. Okay, so get your questions in mind. We're gonna, we're gonna each give a quick tip on dealing with these parasocial relationships. And then I think we already have a volunteer for the mic. Yeah. Uh, the person here is going to come around once we start asking for questions and have a question, or I will ask you to go find one. Yeah. If you don't find one, I will tell you to sit down. Yeah. You will laugh, I don't know why. No, no, this is the thing, you are absolutely correct, because whenever I'm on right now, question's in the form of a question. It's a one-part question. Make it as short as possible so we can get to as many questions as possible, and then someone will get up and they'll be like, well, first, the discursion on this, I'm like, no, <laughs> no. We have we laid out the rules, we have all agreed to these rules, so let's do that. Mer thinks we should have a moderator off. I was really thinking that, because I've seen both of you moderate, and you're very similar, you're both very good, but I don't know who's best, so I'm really glad. <laughs> <laughs> you, know, you know what, it's not a competition. You and I are looking in the same direction as a moderator, so, and you are the moderator, so it is your gig and not mine. I just need a general. Yeah. Um, okay, a quick tip for how to deal with these types of relationships, each of you go, and then, if I can give our volunteers mic while you're doing that. Yeah, uh, I'll start. Um, empathy. Uh, understand that when people are approaching you uh, through whatever means they have, uh, that they are doing it because uh, they are interested in you, excited about you, or whatever. Uh, as much as you can with the information available to you, try to understand their frame of mind because that will make the difference between finding them intrusive, creepy, weird, uh, or just like, all right, I understand that you think this is where we're coming from and you can catch the answer. Now, some of them will be creepy, weird, and la la la, and then you can just block them or whatever, but most people come from a place of good. Um, so practice your empathy and understanding. I agree with John, but I wanna say on the other side, learn about all of the uh, ways social media allows you to protect yourself. Yes. Um, I think, I, I just, it, it hurts me, and, and this is so hard to say because I worry it's victim blaming, but it hurts me when I hear about somebody who, like somebody from Star Wars making it big and then the fan harassment just flows over them. And I'm like, did they not lock their DMs? Did they not let people who don't follow them not, can't, not uh, comment? I mean, there's so many ways you can try to lock down and make your social medias uh, safer for you. Yes. And um, I, yes. Empathy and all that. I'm not just saying like close the door and lock it. But if you do have anything open, like I like people say DMs are open. I'm like I, my DMs haven't been open Never. since like 2010. Never. <laughs> no. Never. So uh, yeah, if, if you have a problem like that, then one thing you want to do is, is just learn about the social medias and what they offer you for your safety. Yes. Yes. Yeah. In in the same vein, really, um, media literacy is really important because when you're using these different um, platforms, they're giving you kind of, um, you're, you're engaging in like a different, a different mode of affect and often we, we don't think about it. 
So think about, like, for the fans, think about the social media that you're using and think about, are you actually fixating on anyone? Do you have this pull, this identification, this relationship with them? And just, like, think about that and examine that as if there was someone you knew, like, where is this coming from? Like, what's going on that, that I really, like, need this bond? And how can I manage it responsibly, get something good out of it? And leave them alone. <laughs> <laughs> You know, in addition to what everyone said, mine is don't feed the flame. Because yeah. a lot of people do this because they want attention. And whether it's negative attention, positive, or they just are really into what you're, you're doing, your product, what have you, and they just really want acknowledgement when they're weird and creepy about it, or, you know, this is gonna sound weird, but um, an, an instance is someone that uh, Sam Bayer and I both know, and we, they approached them at Gen Con and said, Oh yeah, we worked together, we were on a panel together, knowing good and damn well they were not on this panel, they were sat in the audience in the front row, but said this to the person on the panel as if they were just gonna go, yeah, yeah, sure. And that was a form of A, parasocialist, but also like, you're, you're chasing some thought with really the wrong person. And so they got clocked for that and got told and embarrassed. Yeah. So when people are clearly trying to poke at you and poke at you and reply to everything you post, Mute them, and if it gets weird, or they constantly try to tweet at you, or blue sky, I refuse to say speak. Um, whatever social media they're interacting with, or if they come in, like for streaming, it's like, here's five gift subs, here's ten gift subs, because they want that dopamine hit of you acknowledging them. Yeah. Block them, mute them, and warn your community if it becomes a point where you think you might be in danger. Yeah, and that was the one that was hardest for me to learn, and I only learned it once I left Twitter, that just blocked as soon as it engaged. Otherwise, you, you'd never see the No, there's someone who is literally liking and replying to almost everything I've tweeted, and I tweet a lot, especially when I'm at an event. I was like, oh no, I see where this is going. <laughs> and I'm like, oh cool, I'm just going to stop tweeting until I get home from Glasgow. That's rubbish. Oh, it is, I'm going to stop streaming because people are terrible. And with that, right now it's. Raise your hand, have cues for a question. Wow. All right, uh, right here in front. Um, thank you for that great discussion. Um, what are your tips? Let me flip what you've been talking about. What are your tips to fans to make sure we can cross the line? Because I, I, it's something I'm really conscious yeah. of when I'm following people. I'm like, I'm not sure comments, because you just made that point of not, oh, give, give not loving point. everything they say. And, so, yeah. so yeah. the question is, how can fans realize that they are yeah. potentially being parasocial? My tip is remember, you do not know this person. Yeah. You follow them online, you like their writing, you like whatever they do. You literally do not know them as a person. Do not approach them as if you are actual best friends. Yeah. Um, I will add to this. Um, I think with the fan community, there is also the aspect of uh, uh, you're not neurotypical. A lot of you are not. And sometimes <laughs> it is. And this is not a negative, okay? But it does mean that you have to practice when to disengage. You have to practice when to that awareness. And so part of the responsibility for being in the world is uh, making, uh, making an effort to understand where those, where those boundaries are and, and being aware of them. Now you're looking at me with a worried yeah, face. I, I would say that I think actually a lot of neurodivergent people have had to practice these skills so much that often we're more aware than neurotypical yeah. people. So I think that's a great tip across the board. Um, but I perhaps wouldn't target it to just uh, neurodivergent people. Yeah, uh, not, hashtag not only neurodivergent, <laughs> but certainly within the panel community that is something like that. Um, you guys right now are in a different situation than mostly because you are at a convention and we are at a convention and we are at a convention in part to see you when you're in, here to see us. And so don't not that's a dumb thing. I know, I'm trying, I'm trying. Uh, like going up to somebody and saying, I love your work. Yes. That is awesome. Yes. Just approaching somebody after a panel and saying, really enjoyed the panel. Keep it short. And if they, <laughs> if they have time and they want to keep talking to you, they'll keep talking to you. Yeah. But if not, then you got to talk to your person and that was cool and, and you know, call them in. Yeah. But, I mean, yeah, to be fair, I have to spend a lot, I, I spent a lot of time learning how to disengage uh, so that other people know that we're, we're, we're done. Um, and, as, and 
I found that people are like, oh yes, thank you. And then and they walk away. So that's, uh, that's a good thing too. But yes, no, come and say hello. All right, here in the red hair, and then I see you way in the back. I Oh, are you wearing the Watsy Pride shirt? Yes, you. That are pointing to yourself, oh, you. No. Oh, sorry, I, I can't read. Pac-Man's dead, and he comes to Ghost, and he's like, hey, Ghost, let's hang out. I, I play Pac-Man, I got you. Uh, right here, right here. <laughs>
a oh. thing. It's fine. It's fine. Yeah, and, and you know, and just understand that sometimes someone may be in a hurry. Uh, Dublin Worldcon. Oh my God, I forgot mm -hmm. who it was. But we were on our way to the You Go Losers party, and mm -hmm. this fan came up to one of the authors we were with, and they were just like, "Oh my God, can I get a photo?" And they were just very gently, "I appreciate it. Thank you for stopping us, but we actually have a car waiting. The con isn't over. I'm sure I'll see you the rest of the week." And it was a very gentle. I love to normally, but we're in kind of a hurry. It's just that very gentle and humane yeah. way to go. I appreciate it. I'm so glad you're a fan. Um, I usually go, hey, I know that person. I need to go. And if you catch me on a mat, they'd be like, I'm tired. I'm going home. Goodbye. Uh, okay, we are about five minutes before they come and wave the paper at me. Um, I am short and can't really see any hands. Uh, can, I, can, I, can I use panel's privilege because I know someone who I think will have an interesting question? All right, but you owe me a drink later. Yeah, deal. <laughs> um, all the way back uh, with the red hair. Oh, I see those people you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you. Um, uh, also, thank you so, so much to everyone on the panel. I'm also really short, so I can't see any of you. Hi. Hi, it's really great. Um, so uh, I've been doing some things with other guys since as long as I've been a writer. And, uh, but I came of writing age in, like, actually in my first month of life, I was in the middle of race fair, and I sat and debated. So oh, I'm so sorry. It was an important learning experience. But my question is about power. Because uh, power social relationships have a lot of power, so a, a lot of power social relationships is a vector of power whether or not you use it. Yeah. And I've often been, you know, I'm a female gender-ish person, and often people will resent you for having that power. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering, I'm always uh, interested in how people negotiate that in their lives because power is morally neutral. And it's just about what you decide to do with it. And uh, pretending, I've often found that one of the worst things to do is to pretend you don't have it, even though I'm English. Sorry to be sorry to be here. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, so, like, I have an entire culture built on not acknowledging how we have it on the So, uh, so let me make sure I'm summarizing also so we make sure we end on time. Just basically, what do you do with the power that the parasocial relationship gives you? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, I have plenty of thoughts, but uh, John, since you use your mod, your panel is privileged. No, this is actually an incredibly interesting uh, question for me because I am someone who is naturally at, at near the top of the power curve anyway, right? Um, and I I had made the observation years ago, um, old man's work came out when I was 35. Um, if I had come out when I was 25, I would have been just me to the shit out of because I would not have known what to do with the power that had been provided to me in fandom, in uh, the community, any of that sort of stuff. And I think it is absolutely relevant because I know me, I live with me every day. I am not impressed with me and I don't think about the power that I have on a day-to-day -day basis because my, sh my cat shits on my carpet, right? <laughs> uh, but, but when I am online, when I am at Worldcon, when I am in these places, um, there is power that I wield. And it is very difficult for me sometimes to know where that line was. And I'm a more responsible wielder of it at 55 than I was at 45 and when I was at 35. I am fortunate that I have friends that call me on my shit, right? And that is absolutely important. And equally importantly, that I listen to them. Um, which is hard sometimes for a white guy to do. Um, but uh, it has been an evolving situation for me to learn to moderate my uh, power and to understand that, uh, that the situation of the power, just because I don't wield it doesn't mean it's not there. I have to be careful with, even with what I say as a snarky comment will reverberate down through the time. You talk about race bail. I made a snarky comment in race bail and I ended up showing my ass for it. So, uh, and I ended up having to apologize and that rolled around and it was much better that I did that. But that was my first smack in the face of you have power and you need to respect the fact that you have power. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I'm a 
I feel like I'm a little too awkward to answer that question because I I don't know what to do with the power sometimes, and uh, sometimes I do deny that I have it. I'll be honest because I'm awkward and not sure how to deal with it. But I mainly just try to treat everyone with respect and um, hope that they get the clue and treat me with the same respect. Like I said, introducing myself, even though they clearly know who I am, it still feels wrong just to go, "Hey, you know me." Um, but yeah, I I. I don't know if I figured it out yet. I got a, I got a bunch of jobs. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, just quickly, I suppose it can be really good to um, practice, like what we were talking about earlier, practice explicit boundaries. If you know you have that community, there's there's no harm in writing a post um, talking about like how you want them to conduct themselves. Like on Twitch, you have moderators, you have guidelines for interaction. So if there's if there's any doubt, um, put put those boundaries in place. Uh, for me, I'm very aware of the power I wield, and it really freaks me out because I am not always the nicest or kindest person, and I, I, it is a constant internal struggle when someone has pissed me off to not turn to the dark side and go, I'm going to destroy you, but I don't do it. I do try to use whatever social capital people keep giving me to raise other people, and for me, that's where I'm like, oh, I'm making a TTRPG. I know these really dope people. I'm going to bring them with me if they want to come with, because for whatever reason, people in this space trust me, and that's not like a self-deprecating thing, and I am always baffled by this, but now we've got a game coming out. Everyone has something that they can put their name on, and maybe next year be on stage with a Yugo, I don't know. Um, but for me, it's the, I know it's there, but I try to ignore it because I know myself a little too much. Yes. Yeah. Um, and with that, we are actually one minute over time, but before we go, very quickly, what are people doing? Because I'm going to get whisked away to go to Yugo rehearsal. Yeah. Um, I think all of us might be. Thank you for running around with Mike. But quickly, what are you doing next, if anything, at Welcome? I'm done. <laughs> yeah, this is my last one. I'll be uh, running to go get pretty for the Yugos, to lose a Yugo. I'm also going to run to get pretty. <laughs> uh, I'm going to look presentable and give away to you guys. <laughs> <laughs> <Nice. laughs>